Greetings and welcome back to the Old Ways Rising Farm YouTube channel for a discussion on choosing trees for your orchard vis-a-vis -vis pollination. And this, this is a co topic that comes up a lot in conversations about orchard trees. How many do I need for pollination? What do I need for pollination? How do I think this through? How do I make sure that I actually get fruit out of the trees that I plant? And I wanted to come and have this conversation. Now, as I was thinking about this, I thought, you know, this, this could be a chalk talk video, but you know what? This. So I thought we'd come out here in this beautiful, beautiful grove of feral apple trees that have been spread by the dung of deer and bear and just enjoy the beauty of this, you know, mid-spring day and have a little conversation about these things. So enjoy the scenery. <laughs> It's prettier than a chalkboard, right? Much. Anyhow, in talking about pollen and pollination, the first thing I want to say is just very simply, the biology of sexual reproduction in plants, in the broadest possible strokes, is pretty much what you would expect. Pollen is the male contribution equivalent to sperm, and the uh, ovary in the, the flower contains the egg. It receives the pollen, fertilization occurs, and a seed is born. In fruits that we want to eat, those are plants which are depending on animals to disperse the seeds from one location to another. Okay? The saying an apple doesn't fall far from the tree is very, very true. But the apple tree wants its seed to grow far, far from the tree, so it wants a deer or a bear to come and eat the apple and then run off with it, poop the seed out on another mountainside and spread its genetics. Okay? That's the broad strokes, right? You, you get that, you get that, right? If you're an adult in this world, <laughs> you understand the broad strokes, right? Mm -hmm. We're not gonna go into the, the, the nitty gritty details of pollen tubes and pollen germination and, and all of that business. We're gonna talk about the details that relate to choosing trees and setting up an orchard, okay? There's two ways that the pollen finds the ovary, right? The, the, the pistil and then the ovary. Insects or wind, okay? And then there's a couple different ways that a tree can uh, exist relative to the production of those things, right? There's a couple terms we need to go over. Monoecious and dioecious. Monoecious means in Greek, same house. In a monoecious plant, the pollen and the ovary are produced in the same plant, okay? Further, a flower can be perfect or imperfect. A perfect flower, both the ovary and the pollen are produced in the same inflorescence, in the same flower itself, okay? In an imperfect flower, the pollen and the ovary are produced in different regions of the plant or different regions, different florets within a larger inflorescence, okay? Corn is a good example of a monoecious plant. You have the pollen produced in the tassels at the top and then the egg is the, the, the ovary, it's the corn kernel that we eat down in the cob, okay? And the silk, that's the pistils that are receiving the pollen. Okay, monoecious, both the pollen and the egg are produced in the same house, that one corn stalk. Imperfect flower, it's in different regions. These beautiful apple flowers are perfect flowers. The central floral elements are the female receiving pollen. The outer floral elements are the male producing the pollen. And then a bee is gonna carry it from one to the other, insect pollination, okay? Um, that's not true of all plants though. You also have a dioecious condition. Dioecious, different houses. The pollen is produced by one individual plant and then the ovary and egg by a different individual plant, okay? Holly is probably the best known example of a dioecious plant. Your holly bush is either male or female the male hollies produce pollen-bearing flowers, but never a, uh, a holly berry. The female berry-producing plants, the female flowers, the egg, but they don't have any pollen. 
So you need to have a male plant to spread pollen to several females by the wind. They're wind pollinated. Okay. Another example that may show up in your orchard is the uh, persimmon is a dioecious plant. They're male or female. In your landscape, you may have junipers. Junipers are dioecious. You have male junipers that never produce berries and females that do. Okay. Um, those are really the three that you encounter. Most of the rest are monoecious. Tucker the donkey is being loud this morning. <laughs> Most of the orchard plants that we produce, that, that, that you're used to, are monoecious species. Now, in between monoecious and dioecious, there is sort of a hybrid characteristic called gynodioecious, where female plants are usually purely female. But you can have male plants that also have a hermaphroditic characteristic. Okay? So when you have a gynodioecious species, you will have some true male, some true female, and some with characteristics of both. Okay? And those trees can be a, depending on the species and how they respond with pollen other ways, a self-pollinating gynodioecious tree. An example of these is um, Kentucky coffee tree. You're probably not planting that in your orchard, but you might be planting a mulberry. Mulberry is gynodioecious. Most of your fruitful mulberries are true female. They produce no male pollen. Most male mulberries don't have any female florets, but there are a percentage of mulberries that have both male and female on the same tree that is a monaceous individual within a gynodioecious species. Mm. So it can be a little complicated. Okay. Does that extend to a Osage Orange? I'm not sure. Okay. I'd have to look that one up. Okay. I'd have to look that one up. They're in the same um, family. So. They're in the same family, different genus, same yeah. family. I don't know. Okay. Google it. <laughs> um, so you, you have some mixed characteristics there. And it can be a little complicated. A family that is primarily monoecious can evolve dioecious genera, and a family which is primarily dioecious can evolve gynodioecious or monoecious genera. They go back and forth, and they're flexible. <laughs> they're, plants are more flexible than animals in terms of rapid evolutionary change in some of these reproductive characteristics. Okay? So it can be mixed up. Now, how we set up an orchard so that we get good pollination. I'm going to put the wind pollinated trees in a group and the insect pollinated trees in a group and we're going to discuss them separately. The wind pollinated is a lot simpler. There's only a few wind pollinated orchard trees that you're going to care about and they're all nut trees. Okay? <laughs> so you have the uh, um, hazelnut all of your acorns, beech nuts, chestnuts, and all of your um, walnuts, butternuts, and hickories. Those are all wind pollinated species. Except for the hazelnut, they all behave in pretty much the same way. They have, they are monoecious with imperfect flowers. So the flower is going to be a long catkin. Okay? And that catkin is an inflorescence containing many, many small flowers. At the tip of that catkin, you have male flowers, and at the base of the catkin, you have female flowers. In most cases, the female flowers open, receive pollen, close. Then and only then do the male flowers open. Okay? So the female flowers will typically be receptive for two, three days, close, then the male flowers open. So this condition presents an interesting consideration. Can they, if, if you take pollen from plant A and freeze it and then put it on, you know, freeze it in, in true cryogenic conditions so it remains viability and put it on the same plant the next year, will it fertilize? Yes. Okay. They can receive their own pollen and produce a fertile seed. But there's a timing issue. Because the female flowers open and close before the male flowers open. Mm -hmm. So they rarely pollinate themselves. Now there are some varieties of 
hickories, pecans, and walnuts that have some overlap. The female flowers open, and just as they're closing, the male flowers open, but they allow a little overlap for self-pollination. Okay? But most of them pretty much exclude self-pollination through this timing mechanism. Now, when you have a plantation with a hundred of them, they're all going to open up within a week time, but they'll stagger in a little bit. So the early ones to open are pollinating the later ones to open. So when you're thinking about these, think of them in large clumps. Okay? The more you have, the better your pollination because the more you're filling the air with a cloud of pollen to accomplish that pollination, okay? And at the same time, if you think about what I've said, the earlier ones pollinate the later ones. In any planting of these, there has to be a first tree to open that isn't going to get pollination, okay? Now, if you, pl if you have a whole mountainside with a thousand trees, you're never going to notice or know which one is that first one to open and that it's not producing nuts. But if you plant two or three, yeah, you're going to notice that. Why are these two po always producing nuts and this one over here never is? It can be this, po this pollen timing. So large clumps. The more large your clump is, the more you fill the air with pollen and the larger the percentage of trees that are getting good pollination. Now, in the uh, Jugland ACE, the walnuts and the hickories, you, there is more overlap between the male and the female flowers than in the beech family. Okay? So you will, if you pick your varieties well, you can pick some that overlap with pollen shedding time and get pollination from a smaller, you know, from one tree or a small number of trees. But you will still have better pollination and fruit set the larger your clump of trees because the more you saturate the area with pollen. It's exactly the same idea as growing sweet corn. Can you plant one sweet corn plant and have sweet corn? Theoretically, yes. But unless you are deliberately taking the tassel and painting it on the silk, you're going to have really stinky ears that don't have many kernels on them. Because corn needs to fill the air with a cloud of pollen in order to get good kernel set on those ears. Right? This is why you plant corn in large blocks. Yes, it is a monoecious plant. Yes, it is self-pollinating. But the more you fill the air with pollen, the better your corn yield. Nut trees follow that same rule. Um, I said that the uh, um, hazelnut is a little bit different. It is still, when pollinated, it opens its flowers in the middle of winter on warm days and then closes them up on cold to protect them from the frost and does that all winter long. Um, it doesn't have the same timing mechanism, so it can truly pollinate itself, but it's when pollinated, so you still benefit from the cloud of pollen of a large number of trees planted in a clump. Okay? So that's the guideline on the nut trees. Um, the fruit trees, these guys. The majority of the fruit trees that we grow are all in the rose family. Apple, pear, peach, plum, cherry, etc. All of these are rose family fruit trees. And they're all going to play by about the same rules with a couple of asterisks that I'll get to at the end. So the generality is that they are, first off, they are all monoecious species. Okay? They all have perfect flowers. Okay? The um, problem, though, is that if you look at one flower from one of these trees, if, it, if I just take my finger and paint pollen across like this, I'm not actually fertilizing that. Because the ovary in this flower can detect and reject genetically identical pollen. So if I want to hand fertilize this tree, I need to go over to that one. I hope it's not the same off. variety. Huh? And hope it's not the same variety. But these are seed grown, so they won't be. They'll be genetically distinct. Uh, but I need to go get pollen from that one, paint it on this one, and then I will fertilize it. Mm -hmm. okay. It has to be a different genetic individual. Now, Hun, you mentioned varieties. When we are buying trees that are grafted, grafting is a form of cloning. Okay? There is only one red delicious apple in the world. I mean that literally. Okay? 
Now, that red delicious apple, that one original tree, has been grafted onto millions of rootstocks. So that one tree is growing a million times, but it's still genetically one tree. Okay? So if you hear uh, uh, somebody say you need more than one apple for pollination, say, well, I want red delicious, so I'll buy 10 of them. You didn't accomplish anything. You just have 10 branches from one tree. Yes, you dug 10 holes, but you still only planted one tree. Okay? So when you're choosing your varieties, you need to think first, who can pollinate who? And then second, make sure you have more than one variety there. Okay? So if you want Red Delicious, you need to plant something else, right? You can plant your Red Delicious here and then your Honeycrisp here and they'll pollinate each other. Right? I'm just spitballing random varieties. <laughs> okay? Same with all of the other Rose Family fruit trees. They all play by this rule, at least in the broad strokes. Okay? Now, apples are very, very, very promiscuous. All of the apples freely hybridize for all, with all of the other apples. Okay? I don't care whether it's a red delicious, a red flowering crab apple that was planted as a street tree, or one of these random things that grew in the woods and we don't know what they are. They're bear poop apples. Okay? They will all cross. So, when you're planting an apple orchard, if you want a concentration of the same species or you're just getting started or you have a small area to work with and you don't have room to plant a whole bunch of different varieties, ask yourself what's in your landscape. These are all insect pollinated, okay? So a bee is going to do what I was modeling with my little finger up here. A bee is going to land on this, get some nectar, and then fly over to that one or the one up there or the one back behind us, okay? All you have to have is another any apple, ornamental or edible, within reasonable bee flight distance of your apple and you'll get some pollination. Okay? Now here, in you know Pennsylvania, New York area, where, where I do most of my stuff for this channel, right? It's just, <clears throat> apples are just in the landscape. You drive around this time of year, it's hard to find a field row that doesn't have a whole pile of apples some scattered along that field row. Okay? So if you're planting apples, you can get away with a lot in terms of cheating on the pollination rules. Because there are so many apples. <laughs> you know, the bee is going to easily tra transfer pollen from your tree to other apples over the course of a couple hundred yards. Easy. And it's hard, where I'm filming this, it's literally impossible to be more than about 200 yards from an apple tree that's just growing wild. Mm -hmm. That's before we even think about all the ones that people have planted in this area, right? So it's almost impossible to plant a tree, to plant an apple tree here in such a way that you won't get pollination. That's not true of the other fruits, okay? Pears, there are certain pairs that will cross with each other and certain ones that won't. Okay? So you really want to plant domestic pairs of the same species. Okay? So if you're planting European pear, you want two or more varieties of European pear. If you're planting Asian pear, you want two or more varieties of Asian pear. There are a couple wild European hunt crab the cat's bumping the I got it. Around. It's fine. Okay. There are a couple wild European pears that I know grow in this area. So could I plant a European pear and get some pollination? Yes, but they're a long ways away, so I'm not going to get good pollination, and pears are not as attractive to bees as apples are. So your pears want to be closer together than your apples need to be. Okay? And I don't have any Asian pears, so I would need to definitely plant two or more varieties of Asian pear to get Asian pear production here. That's even more true when we go to the stone fruits, which simply do not exist wild in the landscape here at all. Okay? And your stone fruits are even pickier than the pears. So if you're planting peaches, you need peaches. Now, nectarine is a peach, so, so they count, right? You need two varieties of peach, you need two varieties of 
apricot. You need two varieties of the same species of cherry. Okay? So if you're planting sour cherries, you need two sour cherries. If you're planting sweet cherries, you need two varieties of sweet cherry for best pollination. Okay? If you go down country, walking around southern Pennsylvania down through there, sweet cherry does show up in the landscape. So if you know your area and you know there's, oh, there's, there's a dozen, you know, prunus avium out around the, the, the field rows and hills where you live, well, then plant sweet cherries and don't worry about it just like I don't worry about where I plant an apple, okay? So know what's in your landscape. It counts to your favor, okay? Northern Pennsylvania and New York, we just really don't have stone fruits growing wild at all. So you have to be responsible for all the pollination. That's the broad strokes. There are some exceptions. The first exception are pollen sterile varieties. And you get pollen sterile varieties when you get polyploid varieties. That means that some of the chromosomes are duplicated and the fruit tree has an extra dose of genetic material. Polyploidy in humans produces Down syndrome, but polyploidy in fruit trees produces very big fruit. Hmm. Okay, so a lot of those apples that are gigantic apples are polyploid, hmm. diploid or triploid. Okay, now having that extra genetic material is a benefit to a plant, whereas it's a detriment to an animal. But in some groups, it leads to infertility. Okay, and rose family fruit trees it leads to infertility, okay? So Bartlett and Sequel are two common pollen sterile pears. There's also pollen sterile apples. Um, Gravenstein is a pollen sterile apple. Diploid, I'm pretty sure. Um, um, blanking out on the other one. Baldwin, Baldwin is a pollen sterile diploid, okay? Uh, there's others. There's others in both groups. If you're planting a pollen sterile variety, it needs to receive pollen to be pollinated, but it cannot contribute pollen. So if your your two varieties, which are pollen fertile, pollinating each other, and then your pollen sterile variety is a tack on. It's the afterthought. The second exception, which impacts these trees as well as some of the others, and we're gonna circle back to some of those uh, dioecia species we were talking about, are parthenogenic varieties. Parthenogenic is um, a term which relates to an animal which is producing offspring without fertilization. And this happens in a lot of invertebrates when we talk about trees that are going to do a trick like this, we'll call it parthenocarpic, okay? Referencing self-production of fruit. These are the varieties that get the nomiker self-pollinating, but it's really not true. They are not self-pollinating. They are still rejecting their own pollen, but they don't care. They'll still produce a fruit. <laughs> Seedless watermelon is a parthenocarpic fruit, okay? But it can't reproduce. The fruit that do this, they're producing a sweet wrapper on a sterile seed, okay? So think about your seedless watermelon. It ain't got seeds. The few little shriveled up half seeds aren't fertile. You can't produce a seedless watermelon from a seedless watermelon, okay? It's a terminal hybrid cross. You have two fertile watermelons that you cross and then you get seeds which will then grow into a seedless watermelon. It's a dead end. Same with parthenocarpic fruit production, okay? Now, a lot of peaches in particular, stone fruits, right? A lot of your stone fruits are labeled as self-pollinating. They do that label because the word parthenocarpic makes people's brains melt, <laughs> right? So they use words that are more familiar, but it's not really true, okay? Within the rose family, the parthenocarpic varieties will produce fruit without pollination. So you can just plant one if you have a small space. But they will only produce a percentage of their max yield. And they will only do it for so long before they taper off and stop producing. Okay? 
So one of the stories you'll hear about fruit trees and people frustrated with their fruit trees is, oh yeah, my parents had one peach or one plum. It produced great when I was a kid and we always loved eating them peaches or them plums. We still have the tree, it's still strong, but it hasn't produced fruit in 20 years. That was a parthenocarpic variety that was not receiving pollination. So for a short period of time, usually you'll get good production for 10, 15 years and then it tapers off and by 25 or 30 it's done. Okay. Orchards love these, like commercial orchards love these because they wanna have a whole row of all the same variety so they can just have people, people go pick them, throw them in boxes, and they don't have to worry about mixing up their varieties. And they just plan on a 15 to 20 year replacement cycle of their trees. So they don't care. But if you're a home orchardist, you want to plant one tree that the grandkids are going to be able to still enjoy. You need to for pollination to keep the production up. If you're hearing me say this, and you're thinking, oh, so that's what happened to my peach tree. Go buy another peach tree. <laughs> As soon as you bring in a pollen source, it will return to production, and you'll be good again, okay? It doesn't permanently turn the tree off. The tree just gets sick of wasting its energy on fruit that aren't resulting in children. So it quits, and it waits makes for sense. pollen to come in. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it does. Now, there are a few fruit trees that are kind of parthenocarpic almost forever, and they're so, they are uh, some of the persimmon varieties that are common in commerce and some of the uh, uh, mulberry varieties that are common in commerce, like Illinois Everberry, okay? You can plant that by itself, and it's going to be parthenocarpic for several human lifetimes. It just doesn't care. It's not going to turn off. That's also true of a lot of the persimmons, right? Remember persimmon dioecious, true dioecious, male and female. Male one, female the other tree, okay? Yet people plant one persimmon and off they go. They've got persimmons. It's a parthenocarpic tree and it will continue in that character forever on a human time scale, right? It's not going to turn off and just stop. Those don't care. But these guys, all these rose family fruit trees that we know and love are in that category, okay? So those are kind of the exceptions there. Um, also with this, we're, when we're talking about the stone fruits, and I forgot to mention this earlier, that includes the almond. You know, the almond is very closely related to peaches and cherries. It's in that same genus. So what I'm saying of those things applies to your almonds. Um, an almond is one of the ones that is often treated as parthenocarpic. And it will be for a decade or two. And then it will taper off unless you have some other varieties hold it. Okay? <laughs> now, don't let this discourage you. Sometimes you know, I'll tell people like this and they'll just say, oh, I only have room for one and give up. Or only I have money for one this year and, and give up. Well, no, no, no. Don't give up. First off, if you only have room for one tree, get one that can be pollinated by trees in the landscape. What is that? I don't know. You have to know your landscape. Know what your neighbors are growing. Know what is growing in the fields, right? So if you're in the suburbs and you only have room for one tree, look over the fence. Look down your road. What are your neighbors planting? Well, if the three or four houses down, they've got a whole bunch of peach trees, you're safe with a peach. You'll get their pollen, okay? Um, so on and so forth for any kind of tree. You can go together with other neighbors and work together, right? So if you have four people on a block that each want one tree, pick a species and all plant the same tree, work together, okay? Know your landscape, know what's here. If you've got apples all over, you're safe with apples. And pay attention to the street trees too with apples because all of those like prairie fire crabs that are planted all over street trees, they will pollinate any apple, okay? And second, if the problem is time, you don't have enough time to plant more than a couple trees or um, you're money limited and can only afford one now and then, remember trees are a long-term investment and building an orchard is a long-term project. Plant what you have time and money to plant this year, plant what you have time and money to plant next year, 
don't be afraid to take five or ten years to build up your orchard to its final characteristic. Okay? Say you're clearing land. You, you're, you're not in the suburbs. You have 10 acres or 20 acres or 100 acres, but it's all wooded. And you're clearing out some patches around the house. And you only have a spot for one tree now, but you're going to clear that other patch five years from now. Put your tree in. Get it established. When you clear that other patch five years from now, plant then. You'll get your pollen, you'll get your production, and this tree that you planted this year will be ahead of the game. So don't be afraid to take your time and work into these projects. Okay? And if none of that works, plant a mulberry. <laughs> okay. Anyhow, I hope this helps and I hope this explains some of these ideas and, and gives you some ideas about planting your plantings and, and how these different things fit together. And I hope you've just enjoyed this beautiful scenery on this beautiful spring day. It smells um, lovely. It is lovely. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I wish this was, this was smell a vision because it's very, very sweet mm -hmm. right here. You can smell and it from 20 feet away. this is a honeysuckle just starting to bloom too, so it's contributing to the smell of vision that's around us right now. Mm -hmm. So if you enjoy this, um, if you've learned something, if there's been a benefit to you, give it a, go ahead, give it a thumbs up. YouTube algorithm will then know that you enjoyed it and show it to others. If you're so inclined to help the channel, we do have a Patreon. This is an unmonetized, um, unsponsored channel, so everything is just out of my back pocket. Um, if you would like to contribute to help so that I would be able to free up time, do more things, do better things, invest a bit more in, in you know, materials and resources or travel to go and build this channel, um, I would be most grateful for that as well. But either way, I hope that you will continue watching and join us here next time at Old Ways Rising Fun.